Take your Bible, if you would, please. Genesis chapter 20. We're going to kind of squeeze our way through this chapter and uh, not spend a whole lot of time in it. Um, we are going to, uh, there is a lesson to be learned here about lying, about not trusting the Lord in telling the truth, okay? Not trusting the Lord by telling the truth. Just, would, would, God, would God rather have you lie or would he rather have you tell the truth even to your own hurt? Which way is it? The truth even to your own hurt. Now there's times when I've had to learn that lesson the hard way. I didn't like it. I didn't like it, but I, and I was afraid. Uh, things I really, I, I don't want to talk about. But there are lessons nonetheless that I was confronted with either telling the truth or a lie. And uh, there, there is one, I'll, one story I'll tell here in a minute. And, um, and it just, God just worked it out and God blessed. And God showed me that day, Mike, you need to, you need to trust me. You need to trust me, okay? I'm, I'm a lot better God than you think I am. And I really am in control of things that you're not in control of. And uh, so God kind of taught me a lesson that day. But Genesis chapter 20, I'm glad you came tonight. It's good to see everybody. It's good to have folks with us online telling us uh, what kind of job we're doing. And, uh, and which we, we're fine with because if the stream ain't right, we want to be able to do it. Um, I guess I'm going to go ahead and... and uh, tell this, um, do I sound okay? Okay. As long as I sound okay back there. Um, Southwest Radio uh, out in Bethany, Oklahoma, it's in Oklahoma City area, northwest Oklahoma City. Uh, I, I have been uh, friends with many of those men for several years. I think the first thing that I ever did uh, for them, I don't remember exactly what year that was. Might have been, uh, oh, I don't remember. But anyway, they... Um, I showed them my book, which I called at that time the King James Code, and um, they looked at the manuscript, they liked it, they wanted to publish it, Hutch, Noah Hutchings didn't like the title of it, so he asked me to change it, I went, man, I don't want to change it, but if he was gracious enough to publish it, I thought, well, I'll change it for him, so I called it By Divine Order. And he liked that one, so they published that one. And then uh, he wanted me to write a... At first it started out as a rewrite of... Noah Hutchings wrote a book called God the Master Mathematician. And he wanted me to sort of do an update to it. Well, I wrote out this pretty good sized book. And he read it and he decided it wasn't an update to his, to his book, it was his own book. So he said, what are you going to call this one? I said, the King James Code. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good idea. And uh, so anyway, that's how that got all turned around. Uh, but anyway, they published them through Hearthstone Publishing, which is now doesn't exist anymore. And uh, we did conferences for them in different places and um, had a good time with them and... Um, was always commended for standing up for the King James Bible. And so 
uh, shortly, a couple years before Hutch died, I've told this story, he offered me his job and uh, flew Lisa and I into Oklahoma City and showed us around the offices and everything like that, told us it was a board-run ministry, which means I have a dozen bosses telling me what to do. And he said some of them were pretty heavy donors. And I went, nah, I think I'll pass that up. I, I really, I would have done it for him because I loved him so much. He, he, Noah was just a good, godly man. I just loved everything about him. Uh, he was a very honest and sincere man. He was an unassuming man. In fact, the first time I met him, when he walked into the recording room where we were going to do the radio uh, uh, the radio interviews, he walked in, pants pulled up over his belly button, you know, like an old man, and he had a piece of Rice Krispie treat stuck on his lip, and he was eating one. And uh, I'm going, okay. But still sharp, he was 77 then, sharp as a tack. He showed me the typewriter that he used. It was an old manual typewriter, and that's how he picked out all his books. So anyway, they have a, they have an, I, I think a new young guy running or helping to run the ministry, and I, and I really like him. Um, he seems to be somebody uh, that is easy to work with, and so they have uh, sent me a list of about six conferences that they're putting on in 2022 in different places. One of them's in Florida, one of them's in Tennessee, um, Indiana, Kansas, uh, and yes, in Indiana, a lot of you guys in Indiana would would be able to attend this. It's, um, where is it? Um, it's north and east of Indianapolis, pretty good sized town. I can't think of it. But anyway, um, they're going to have one there, they're going to have one in Kansas, one in Oklahoma, and then they asked our church if we would host one of their conferences next year. So I talked to the board about it, and uh, sort of have tentative approval, uh, pending whether or not I want to make sure that all their speakers use the King James. And I uh, just kind of want that guarantee if, and we'll use our streaming facilities and just offer them what we have to offer here. And uh, we'll just take it from there. So just help us pray about that. Uh, and when I get in contact with them and just kind of go over a couple of these minor issues, well, they're, they're minor in that all they have to do is say, yes, all of our guys, we insist they use King James. That's great. That's fine. It's all we care about. Uh, I may or may not necessarily agree with everything any of the speaker says, and I hope you all understand that. Um, but um, to be able to partner with them and work with them, uh, they're, they're a good ministry. They, they have been over the years, and uh, since Hutch has passed away, gone on to be with the Lord, I think they have, at least it seemed to be, they've maintained that integrity. So anyway, looking forward to working with them in that, and you help us, you help us pray about that, all right? Um, let's see here. What was I going to say after that? I can't think of anything. All right. So anyway, Genesis 20, uh, very quickly, uh, the Bible says in Abraham, this is, we, we've, we've gone through... Uh, Genesis 19, we've had the sons of, of Lot born out of incest from the two daughters of Lot, Moab and the Ammonites, and there's going to be problems now running into them over the years. Now, we have, now we're back to Abraham, dealing with him. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward south, the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, now this is the second time he's done this. 
He said, Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. <laughs> As if that makes it better. <laughs> okay? She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Second time now. Abraham, you didn't learn from the first lie you told. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her and said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Abimelech didn't know it. His people didn't know it. And so far he had committed no fornication with her. So Abimelech was clean in this. But God was just giving him a warning and waking him up to the fact that Sarah is not who you think she is. Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocent, innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. In other words, God said, I didn't allow any situation where you had an opportunity to go in under her. I kept you away from her. I wouldn't let you sin with her. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. I did not allow you to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. We don't think of Abraham that way, but that's who he is. He is a prophet. He's a man of God. And he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know, now thou, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. So it's an easy choice that Abimelech has to make. Since you haven't laid a hand on her, and now that you found out that she really is more than Abraham's sister, she's his wife, and of course if you go in under her, I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to kill everybody in your family, and I'm going to kill everybody in your kingdom as well, Abimelech's got a pretty easy choice to make. Uh, I'm sorry, this, this woman's tainted. She taint yours and she taint mine. Amen? I'm surprised some of you didn't laugh at that better. Taint yours and it taint mine. So, um, verse 8, Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears and the men were sore afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I, what have I offended thee? What, in other words, what did I do to you to deserve this? You tried to, Abimelech's probably thinking, he, he tried to set me up with his own wife. What was he thinking? What have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me in my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. Now once again, the Bible does not gloss over, nor retract, nor... Uh, what is it they do when they CIA marks documents out? Redact them. God says, I haven't redacted any of these stories here. They are exactly as they happened. I'm letting you know that even though I call Abraham the father of faith, the father of many nations, 
and a great and mighty seed is going to come out of his loins and he is my man and there is no one more faithful than he. Abraham is still a fearful sinner. And it really is. It is fear that drives Abraham in this situation. It's fear. What is, what is his fear? What is his fear? Huh? Yeah, or that his wife is going to be taken by somebody else to be wife. Well, what happened? She was taken. Okay? And, and, you, and what you said was right too. Abraham's probably thinking, well, they'll kill me and steal her. And it makes you wonder. Uh, we haven't gotten to chapter 22 yet. The greatest thing that Ab Abraham is ever going to do is but a couple chapters away here in chapter 22. It makes you wonder, where is that faith? that we see exhibited in Genesis 22 where Abraham literally takes Isaac and lays him on an altar, binds him down to that altar and takes a knife and holds it over his chest and is about ready to plunge the knife in, thinking that even if he kills his only begotten son, that God will resurrect him and out of him will come the seed of Abraham. He believes that then. But where is that faith now? It's not there. You see, sometimes we will have great faith. Sometimes we will move mountains. Sometimes we will have days where the devil cannot touch us. But then there's going to be those days where we're not so steadfast, not so sure, where we're weak. And so we invent lies and we try to hide things and we pretend that we are things that we really aren't and so on and so on and so on. And Abraham definitely is not exhibiting that kind of faith that we see just two chapters later. He's not, he's not showing that kind of faith at all. He's very, very, very weak. Um, let's see here. Where were we? Verse 9. Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me in my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? Abraham said, because I thought, and my old boss, Ron Dagonia, brother Ron Dagonia, pastor, what's the name of his church? Church of Many Blessings. I learned quickly never to say to him, well, Ron, I thought, because the first time I said it to him, I said, I made a mistake, did something dumb. And Ron said, Hoggard, why did you do this? And I said, well, I thought that, he said, that's the problem right there. So, Hoggard, you need to understand, when I hired you, I hired you from here down. And he meant it, too. He said, I don't pay you from here up. You don't get paid enough to think. Now, if I give you a little bit more money, then take that as a token that I'm allowing you to think just a little bit, but not much. And he meant it. First raise he gave me. He said, now that, that requires you to think exactly that much more than what you've been thinking so far. Okay. He was hard on me. He really was. I'd come home tears sometimes. Uh, but anyway, uh, Abraham said, because I thought, 
Surely the fear of God is not in this place. And they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. And she really was his sister. That was not a lie. She is my sister. She is the daughter of my father. But not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. So back then, it was allowed. The genetics had not been passed around the world to such an extent as you did not fear genetic defects, you didn't fear uh, mild retardation or what do they call it now, Down syndrome, Mongolism. They didn't fear things like that. It was a that Cain, uh, Cain obviously married one of his sisters. Obviously. Or maybe even a couple of dozen of them. Who knows? Because we know that Adam and Eve, after, after uh, Cain, Abel, and Seth, we know the Bible says that they had sons and daughters. We don't know exactly what year Eve would have stopped uh, having children. We um, are not given the date of Eve's death, but it's quite possible she lived to be eight to nine hundred years, just like Adam did. And so, how many children? Melissa, can you have in 700 years? Whew! Enough to where you don't have to lift much of a finger around the house if you don't want to, right? If you raise them right, you don't have to do a whole lot. Uh, but anyway, she was the the daughter of his father, but not the daughter of his mother. Stepsister is what we call it. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is thy kindness, which thou shalt show unto me at every place whither we shall come. Say of me, he is my brother. Which technically wasn't a lie but they were hiding the fact that they also were married and Abimelech took sheep and oxen this is what it cost him he took sheep and oxen and manservants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah his wife it's starting to sound like the Jerry Springer show. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Draw where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Woo! He struck it rich. That's a pretty good scam you got going there, Abraham. All you need to go is from city to city and tell everybody this is your sister. And when they steal her, say, wait a minute, she's my wife. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Thus she was reproved. So Abraham prayed unto God. And God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants and they bare children because God dried everybody's womb up because Abimelech stole Sarah. God took all of his servants, everybody dried their wombs up. Nobody's getting pregnant, nobody's having any babies, nothing's going on here. 
And uh, God healed Abimelech. Verse 18, For the Lord had fast closed up all the wounds of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And what did, what did Abraham have to fear? Nothing. Apparently, we find out that Abimelech seems to be a pretty decent guy. Had Abimelech known that Sarah was in fact Abraham's wife, he would have left it alone. And the cursings of God would not have come down upon the house of Abimelech. But it was Abraham's fear that brought that. I, um, I truly believe that fear, and I never used to be this way, but the older I get, I guess, I don't know if it's a result of COVID. I've talked to a couple of other pastors that say that they have experienced um, issues of depression and anxiety since they've had COVID. And whereas before, they never had these issues before. And uh, I, I, I would tell them, yeah, I know, what that's, I know what that's like. That's exactly what happens to me. So I've had to deal with um, issues of not so much depression, some depression, but the anxiety, um, sometimes it kicks in pretty hard. Now, I will let you know that I am on uh, a couple medications for that. One is a sort of a long-term medication. It takes a while to build up in your body. And after I got a dosage increase, it seems to be helping with uh, the anxiety attacks and I will tell you there's there's nothing worse than I'm sitting there ready to do a PMO and I get this anxiety attack and I know what's going to happen that fear over nothing is going to take over my thought processes and I'm not, there's not a thing that I can do about it. And there's not anything that I have to say either. There's nothing, there's nothing that I can say. And uh, a couple times I've just turned the feed off. And said to myself, Mike, you can't do this. And it's tough. It's really hard to deal with that. Because uh, my favorite, my favorite thing, still my favorite thing to do here is Pastor Mike online. And when the devil works his best to try to take that away, um, it bothers me. It really does. So I appreciate all your prayers and so on. But I, I have learned that fear is probably one of the biggest tools that the devil will use against people. In this whole chapter, Abraham's whole issue was fear. Fear over what amounted to a false, false idea, false impression. In fact, there was absolutely nothing in that obedience Abimelech ever said to him that made him think that Abimelech was looking at his wife and was going to steal her. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. He'd not heard any stories. People tell him, oh, I'd watch Abimelech. Whew. Man, he really goes after the women. And in fact, if you show up with Sarah, you better keep her well hidden because one look at her and he'll take her. He'll steal her. He'll kill you over her just to get her. Abraham had not heard anything like that. 
His mind invented it. His mind made it up. So you could probably say the devil planted that idea and that image in his mind to cause him to lie and set up this whole thing now with Abimelech to cause Abimelech to sin. And Abimelech was, was innocent. He hadn't done anything wrong. Here's, whereas Abraham had an opportunity now to enjoy the company of a good friend, a king of another country, now they've established a relationship on the wrong footing. All over fear of what? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing happened. Nothing would have happened. It was all in Abraham's mind these things were going to happen. And I can tell you that the devil loves to instill fear. There are... Um, I follow quite a few paranormal channels on YouTube. And I can honestly say that some of the videos... They just, I believe they're fake. I believe they're fake. You can almost tell they're fake. Uh, I can't really tell you what to look for. But, you know, doors slamming and knives flying through the room and things like that. Uh, I think some of that stuff is set up. However, I do believe, since I do believe in spirits and haunts and ghosts and apparitions and things like that, I think their primary purpose is to cause people to fear. We were talking again last night about an alleged spirit that poses as a child in this church, in this building, Several of the children claim to have seen it. Several of the adults claim to have seen it. I personally have never seen it. I've told Steve and Jenny. If you see a child in this building at night, shoot it. And then try to find out if it's one of my grandkids or not. Shoot first and ask questions later. But... Um, they have told realistic stories. I have no reason to disbelieve them. And people ask me, so what, what, what is that for? It's fear. It, to instill fear in you. To make you afraid of them, even though in reality there's nothing to be afraid of. There literally is nothing to be afraid of. What can they do to you? Can they harm you? I don't believe God will let them. Uh, and even if, even if God let them harm you, you fa it falls in line with Job. God let, God let the devil hurt Job's body. And Job knew it. But he wouldn't curse God. And he just kept giving praise to the Lord. He would not react the way the devil wanted him to react. And that threw the devil. That threw him off completely. So I figured Job by now would be screaming, Get me out of here. I don't, God, I don't want any more to do with you. If this is what serving you gets me, I don't want anything to do with it. Job never said anything like that. And uh, so I, I do believe that fear is a very, very big thing. And I do believe that spirits hang out at cemeteries. Where did the man from the gatherings, where was he living? In the catacombs, in the tombs. Okay? That's their favorite place. Any place associated with death. Any place associated with death. There are going to be spirits there at that place. 
trying to make people afraid, trying to instill fear, or, or, I'll say this, any place where they work with dead people, I believe, and I don't believe this is every embalmer, mortician, funeral director, but I've known funeral directors in my life who lived lifestyles that were very contradictory to the scriptures. And um, I do believe that there are probably a large number of funeral directors, embalmers, people like that, people who work with the dead on a daily basis, who um, let, let's just say they serve the spirits that are around them. And the spirits may be able to give them what they want and what pleases them and what brings them pleasure in life in exchange for we own you type stuff. So I do believe that that's possible. All right, so it's, it's the idea of fear, putting, instilling and putting fear in people's hearts, in people's minds, and uh, then using that fear to take advantage and claim advantage over those people. Uh, Genesis 21, very quickly, that clock is a little wrong. But here, let's look at it. Let's shout and get happy a little bit. The Lord visited Sarah. Amen. Woo, amen. As he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Notice in verse 1, he had to just say it twice, didn't he? God saith it once. Yea, twice. I just got to say verily, verily. I can't just say verily. I'm going to say verily, verily. I'm going to say the Lord visited Sarah, and then I'm going to say it again. The Lord visited Sarah. The Lord did unto Sarah as he said. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at this, listen to this, at the set time. Underline that, underline those two words in your Bible. Set time. Sounds like the quarterback getting ready to get the ball from the center. Down. Set. Time. Of this, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. I believe with all my heart that the day and the hour of the Lord's return is written in this book. I believe it's in here. I believe at one of these days, God's going to draw our attention to it and we're going to go, you mean that? I never thought of that. God says, I know. Nobody did. I, I kept everybody's mind away from that. Because if you would have figured it out, well, that would have blown my whole prophecy that I didn't tell anybody, I didn't, I'm not letting anybody know, not, not the angels of heaven. But I believe the day and the hour, the year, is in this book somewhere. It's in this book. God wrote it down, and he's going to do it exactly the way, Lo, I've come in the volume, I've come in the volume of the book, it is written to me to do thy will, O God. Now what does that tell you? It's written in the volume of the book. 
not only what to do when he comes, but when to do it. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son, Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. Again, we're told that by the eighth day, the immune system is at its peak in a newborn child. So that cutting into that skin and casting, casting away the foreskin of his flesh uh, would not require, uh, I know nowadays they would rub triple antibiotic ointment on it. But back then, having had no such thing, Abraham just took it and cut it off and cast it away and didn't have to worry about his son getting in effect an infection because his son's uh, immune system was at its peak and it just wasn't going to happen. But that's not the real reason why it was the eighth day. Eight is the number for new life, new beginnings. And that little piece of skin on Isaac represents the whole of my flesh that God is going to chop off one of these days and cast it aside. I don't care what he does with it back then. I don't care if it, I don't, I don't care if science gets my body. I don't care if they send my body to a lab, freeze it, and cut it in slices. Have you ever seen them? Have you ever seen books where that's been done? It's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. They will take the human body and they'll they'll either cut it uh, long ways in thin slices, or they'll cut it like this, like bologna, in real thin slices. And each slice will have, you know, they'll, you can identify the parts of the body in each little slice. Like a Jewish deli, you know, like, like you're slicing head cheese. Come on, you've seen head cheese. It's about the same thing. Yeah, Abraham circumcised his son Isaac being eight days old as God had commanded him. So Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was... Uh, was born unto him and Sarah said God hath made me to laugh so that all that will hear will laugh with me now she's really laughing but she's laughing with joy mm -mm -mm. and she said who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah would have given children suck for I have born him a son in his old age and the child grew and was weaned and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned we'll stop right there because now we're getting into Sarah and Hagar and and them two they're going to they're going to start cat fighting and pulling at each other's hair and scratching their, their eyes out and calling each other names and that's never good and so anyway we'll have to deal with that Jealousy between two women. Hmm, has that ever happened? Hmm, let's think about this for a minute. No, it's never happened before in our church. Thank God. Let's stand to our feet. Come on, cheeseburger, up from the gravy. You know that song, Low in the gravy lay. Jesus, my Savior. We actually had a little boy years ago when we had a daycare center that my mom ran. And we had a cute little boy. His name was Jimmy. And he said his favorite song that he liked was Up From The Gravy. Up From The Gravy. Can we sing Up From The Gravy? Sure. Low in the gravy lay. Amen. Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for a good study of your word. Father, help us, dear God, to trust you, not be driven by fear. Not be driven by that. Father, I, and you know me, God, I'm, I'm Mr. Fear. 
If anybody's going to be afraid of something, it's going to be me. If anybody's going to doubt, it's going to be me. I pray, dear God, that you would make me more faithful. More overtaken with faith than overtaken with fear. Leaning on the Spirit instead of leaning and requiring of the flesh. Father, that is the true me. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would admonish me and correct me of those terrible things, Lord. Teach me how to trust you. Teach me how to rely on you. How to uh, yield my heart over to you in all things, trusting you for everything, even the smallest things that I cannot see. Father, bless in each and every one tonight, Lord, that has heard of your word. Give us hope, give us encouragement, give us faith. Help us, dear God, to not be afraid when fear comes knocking at the door. Bless us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You are. Get out of here.